Oh, hello there. I'm Bill Chan. I'm Nimikong. I'm Van Chan. In this class, I'll read to all of you. Chapter 4, Section 1 of A Tale of Two Cities, Book the First Recalled to Life. Ass. Ah. Oh. A Tale of Two Cities, Book the First Recalled to Life. Charles Dickens. Chapter 4, Section 1. When the mill got successfully to Dover. In the course of the forenoon. The head drawer at the Royal George Hotel opened the coach door as his custom was. He did it with some flourish of ceremony. Travel upon. By that time. There was only one adventurous traveller left to be congratulated. For the two others had been set down at their respective roadside destinations. The Muldi inside of the coach. With its damp and dirty straw. Its disagreeable smell. And its obscurity. Was rather like a larger jug kennel. Mr. Oi. The passenger. Shaking himself out of it in chains of straw. A tangle of shaggy wrapper. Flabbing hat. And muddy legs. Was rather like a larger sort of dog. There will be a packet to Calais. Tomorrow. Yes. So. If the weather holds and the wind sets tolerable fair. The tide will serve pretty nicely at about two in the afternoon. So. It. I shall not go to bed till night. But I want a bedroom. And then breakfast. Sir. Is. Sir. That way. So. If you please. Shall concord. Gentlemen's feathers and hot water to concord. Pull off gentlemen's boots in concord. You will find a fine sea called fire. Sir, fetch Barbara to Concord. Stir about there. Anne. The Concord bedchamber being always assigned to a passenger by the mail. And passengers by the mail being always heavily wrapped up from head to foot. The room had the odd interest for the establishment of the Royal George. That other but one kind of man was seen to go into it. All kinds and varieties of men came out of it. Consequently, another drawer, and two porters, and several maids, and the landlady, the coffee room, when a gentleman of sixty, formerly dressed in a brown suit of clothes, pretty well worn, but very well kept with large square cuffs and large flaps to the pockets. Passed on on his way breakfast. The coffee room had no other occupant. That for noon. Then the gentleman in brown. His breakfast table was drawn before the fire. And as he sat, with its light shining on him, waiting for the meal, he sat so still that he might have been sitting for his portrait. Very orderly and methodical he looked, with a hand on each knee, and a loud watch sticking a sonorous sermon under his flapped waistcoat. Brisk fire. He had a good liquor, and was a little vain of it, for his brown stockings fitted sleek and close and were of a fine texture. His shoes and buckles. Two. Though plain. Were trim. He wore an odd little sleek crisp flex and wig. Setting very close to his head. Which wigged. 
it is to be presumed, was made of air. Thus, his linen, though not of a fineness in accordance with his stockings, was as white as the tops of the waves that broke up on the neighbouring beach, or the specks of sail that glinted in the sunlight far sea, a face habitually suppressed and quieted, that it must have cost their owner. In years gone by, some pains to drill to the composed and reserved expression of Tulson's bank. He had a healthy colour in his cheeks and his face, though lined, were a few traces of anxiety. But other people, and perhaps second hand curries, like second hand clothes, come easily off and on, completing his resemblance to a man who was sitting for his portrait. Mr. We dropped off to sleep. The arrival of his breakfast roused him, and he said to the drawer, as he moved his chair to it, Today, she may ask for Mr. Jarvis Lurie, or she may only ask for a gentleman from Tussin's Bank. Yes, sir. Tossin's Bank in London. Is. Sir. Betwixt London and Paris. Sir. A vast deal of travelling. So. Is. We are quite a French house. Is. Sir. Not much in the habit of such travelling yourself. I think not of late years. Indeed, sir, that was before my time here. Sir, before our people's time here. Sir, the George was in other hands at that time. But I would hold a pretty wager. So. That a house like Tulson and Company was flourishing. A matter of fifty. You might trouble that. And say a hundred and fifty. Indeed. Rounding his mouth in both his eyes. As he stepped backward from the table. The waiter shifted his napkin from his right arm to his left. Dropped into a comfortable attitude and stood surveying the gas while he ate and drank. As from an observatory or watch tower. According to the memorial usage of waiters in all ages. When Mr. Louis had finished his breakfast, he went out for a stroll on the beach. The little narrow, crooked town of Dover hid itself away from the beach and ran its head into the chalk cliffs. Like a marine ostrich. The beach was a desert of heaps of sea and stones tumbling wildly about. And the sea did what it liked. And what it liked was destruction. It thundered at the town. To be continued.